Welcome to our journey through timeless wisdom and prophecy. Today we explore profound biblical truths about God, creation, and divine order. In the book of Hosea, we read, For the children of Israel shall abide many days without a king, and without a prince, and without a sacrifice, and without an image, and without an ephod, and without teraphim. Afterwards, how the children of Israel return, and seek the Lord their God, and David their king, and shall fear the Lord and his goodness in the latter days. Hosea 3, 4, 5 This passage speaks of a future time when Israel will reconnect with God and their divinely appointed leader. The prophecy continues in Acts. And to this agree the words of the prophets. As it is written, After this I will return, and will build again the tabernacle of David, the sanctuary, the woman, which is fallen down, and I will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up, that the residue of men might seek after the Lord and all the Gentiles, upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who doeth all these things. All his works from the beginning of the world are known unto God. Acts 15, 15-18 This shows God's promise to restore his dwelling place and unite people in seeking him. A prophecy of the high priest in the sanctuary. And speak unto him, saying, Behold the man whose name is the branch, and he shall grow up out of his place, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. Even he shall build the temple of the Lord, and he shall bear the glory, and shall sit and rule upon his throne, and he shall be a priest upon his throne, and the council of peace shall be between them both two priests. Zechariah 6 to 12, 13. This branch symbolizes a future figure who will unite priestly and kingly roles. The Lord, one person, said unto my Lord, another person, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. The Lord, one person, shall send the rod, a ruler, rodden, out of Zion, feminine, of thy, another person, strength, out of Zion. Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. The Lord, one person, hath sworn, and will not repent. Thou, another person, art a priest for ever, after the order of Melchizedek. Still another person, three persons, the Trinity. Psalms 110, 1, 2, 4. This passage emphasizes the eternal priesthood and kingship of the future ruler. Discoveries like the Qumran manuscripts revealed insights into Melchizedek, a figure described as having a divine role. Melchizedek as Elohim has a place in the divine assembly, the Melchizedek tradition. This supports the idea of a divine figure embodying righteousness and peace. In 1956, in Qumran Cave 11, a parchment about Melchizedek was discovered. It revealed that Melchizedek as Elohim, feminine masculine, has a place in the divine assembly the Melchizedek tradition. The parchment also speaks of the antecedent of the feminine singular suffix, and the person addressed seems to be Melchizedek. Melchizedek, Zedek, an ancient name of Jerusalem, the Jewish encyclopedia. Reflecting on these scriptures, Melchizedek represents the Holy Spirit and Jerusalem symbolizing divine peace and righteousness. The prophecies reveal a future time when God's divine order will be fully realized, 
and the righteous will dwell safely under his care. Jerusalem being the mother of us all, Galatians 4.26, and her name being hidden in the name, Melchizedek, one would naturally conclude that Zedek, feminine noun for righteousness, would indicate Jerusalem, the mother of us all, the Holy Spirit, the branch she, the Lord, Queen Melke, our righteousness, Zedek, Melchizedek. The description of Melchizedek could only pertain to a member of the Godhead, without father, without beginning or ending of heavenly origin, the original only one authentic queen of heaven, the Shekinah. Conclusively, then, Melchizedek, our mother Jerusalem, is a symbol of the Holy Spirit, Melchizedek, king, queen of peace. As Sarah was the earthly representative of the heavenly Jerusalem in her day, we see that there is now another earthly woman, the representative of heaven, who reveals the mother of all living, the Holy Spirit. Elsiah 7, 14, 8, 3, 4. The Lord hath sworn, and will not repent, Thou art a priest forever. After the order of Melchizedek, Psalm 110, 4. In those days shall Judah be saved, and Jerusalem shall dwell safely. And this is the name wherewith she shall be called, The Lord our Righteousness. Jeremiah 33.16 In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manners of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Revelation 22, 2, Leviticus 12, 8 And if she is not able to bring a lamb, then she shall bring two turtles or two young pigeons, the one for the burnt offering and the other for a sin offering, and the priest shall make an atonement for her, and she shall be clean. Psalm 68, 13 Though ye have lean among the pots, yet shall ye be as the wings of a dove covered with silver and her feathers with yellow gold. And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Creation and Divine Image Genesis 1, 26-27 and Genesis 5, 1, 2 describe humanity's creation in God's image. Both male and female are created in this divine likeness, indicating equality and shared dominion over creation. The notion of two atoms suggests a duality within the divine image. Adam the masculine, and Eve, the feminine, where Eve is seen as a higher order of creation and symbolically significant for her role in reproduction and governance. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Genesis 1, 26-27 this is the book of the generations of Adam. In the day that God created man, in the likeness of God made he him. Male and female created he them, and blessed them, and called their name Adam, in the day when they were created. Genesis 5, 1-2 Prophetic Voice and Divine Interaction Hosea twelve thirteen and Genesis 3, 8 highlight the role of prophecy and divine presence in guiding and communicating with humanity. The spirit of prophecy is portrayed as a key medium through which God interacts with and reveals himself to humans. And by a prophet the Lord brought Israel out of Egypt 
and by a prophet was he preserved. Hosea's 12.13 The prophetic voice spirit of prophecy is God's medium of revealing themselves to mankind from the beginning in Eden, where God Elohim, plural, came to earth to speak to Adam and Eve, and where they will again dwell with the righteous who perfectly reflect their image. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. Genesis 3, 8. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, Revelation 21.10. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him, and they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. 22.3. Four, in their image, male and female. Two Adams, male and female, and God said, Let us... The story of Adam's creation, formed of the dust of the ground, mixed with water, mist, a symbol of the Holy Spirit, prefigured the body created, fashioned, for the second Adam, for a habitation of the Spirit. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. Hebrew 10.5 Jesus defined water as living water for the woman at the well. The Son of God, a celestial being, came down from heaven and took a terrestrial body to demonstrate to mankind on earth how they could become celestial beings through an operation of the Spirit, celestial and terrestrial bodies. There are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial, but the glory of the celestial is one and the glory of the terrestrial is another. 1 Corinthians 15.40 this verse contrasts celestial and terrestrial bodies, emphasizing the transformation from a mortal to an immortal state. This reflects the original creation of Adam and Eve in a state of immortality, which changed due to sin. In the beginning, Adam and Eve were created in the image of two celestial bodies, perfect and sinless and dwelt in the supreme glory, the light of God's presence immortal, to live forever. Because of sin, their nature was changed, and their bodies were subject to death after the divine protection. Their halo of light was removed. The story of Eve's creation prefigured the celestial body-man was to have through an operation of the Spirit. She, unlike Adam, formed of the dust, was made from a part of Adam's side of living flesh and bone, and was his second self, his spiritual body. Therefore, Eve was a higher order of God's creation, a second Adam, feminine, who made possible God's command for them to replenish the earth, to rule, and have dominion over it. Dominion was originally given to them both. Adam was made in the masculine image of God the Father, and Eve was made in the feminine image of God the Mother. Adam prefigured Jesus, the second Adam, masculine, Eve, the feminine second Adam created in the image of God, the Mother, prefigured the Holy Spirit, another Comforter, or Messiah, to come in the masculine name of Jesus, 
though feminine in gender, but the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name. He shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. John 14.26 Eve was called Adam by Elohim. This is the book of the generations of Adam. In the day that God created man, in the likeness of God made he him. Male and female he created them, and he blessed them and named them man when they were created. Genesis 5, 1 and 2. Before the fall, Adam called her Woman, but after the fall, he called her Eve, Chava, Hebrew, because she was the mother of all living, a symbol of the one in whose image she was made, the Holy Spirit Mother, ever living, no beginning, no ending. The second Adam created was Eve a female who had a threefold name, woman, Eve, and Adam. In Genesis 1-2, the Spirit of God is termed the irresistible presence of the divine being who hovered as an eagle over her young to care for and protect them. In the creation, the Spirit quickens, makes alive, and transforms matter into a living world by breathing, moving upon the face of the waters. This is the book of the generations of Adam. In the day that God created man, in the likeness of God made he him. Male and female created he them, and blessed them, and called their name Adam in the day when they were created. King James Version this is the book of the generations of Adam. In the day that God created man, in the likeness of God made he him. Male and female created he them, and blessed them, and called their name Adam in the day when they were created. Genesis 5, 1 and 2. The serpent said to Eve, the female image of God, but God knows that whenever you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like gods by knowing good and evil. Gideon, Living Memorial Bible For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Genesis 3, 5 KJV 1900 the Lord God said, Obviously in knowing good and evil man has become like one of us. Genesis 3.22 The written word is simple, self-explanatory, and denotes at least two persons of the Godhead said, Let us make our image, male and female. Genesis 1.26 Symbolism of the Dove and the Spirit Psalm 68.13 and the references to the dove in Matthew 3.16 symbolize the Holy Spirit, highlighting its role in divine communication and presence. As only a symbol of the Holy Spirit came on Jesus and the disciples in the form of a dove on the head of the second Adam, Matthew 3.16, and as tongues of fire on the heads of the one and twenty we must look to still another prophecy to show a personal coming of a masculine and feminine Messiah, an antitypical Adam and Eve, to the lost sheep of the house of Israel in the last days. Typology of Adam and Eve The comparison of Eve to a spiritual body and her prefiguration of the Holy Spirit or a feminine messianic figure, is a unique theological interpretation that sees Eve as a type of the Holy Spirit, contrasting with the masculine figure of Jesus, the second Adam. Jeremiah reveals the antitypical Adam and Eve, the masculine and feminine branch of righteousness, to be raised unto the house of David, 
who is to bring peace to Judah and Israel in the latter days. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. In his days Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely. And this is his name, whereby he shall be called, The Lord our Righteousness. Jeremiah 23, 5, 6 In those days, and at that time, will I cause the branch of righteousness to grow up unto David, and he shall execute judgment and righteousness in the land. In those days shall Judah be saved, and Jerusalem, the sanctuary, the church, the woman, shall dwell safely. And this is the name wherewith she shall be called, The Lord our Righteousness. Jeremiah thirty three fifteen sixteen. Biblical Data God is the rendering in the English versions of the Hebrew El, Eloah, and Elohim. The existence of God is presupposed throughout the Bible, no attempt being anywhere made to demonstrate his reality. God The Supreme Being, regarded as the Creator, Author, and First Cause of the Universe, the Ruler of the World and of the Affairs of Men, the Supreme Judge and Father, tempering justice with mercy, working out his purposes through chosen agents, individuals, as well as nations, and communicating his will through prophets and other appointed channels. Halavai. To sum up his positions, Judah Ha. Levi posits, A. The existence of a first cause, a wise creator always working under purpose, whose work is perfect. It is due to man's lack of understanding that he does not see this perfection in all things. B. There are secondary causes, not independent, however, but instrumentalities. C. God gave matter its adequate form. D. There are degrees in creation. The sentient beings occupy higher positions than those without feelings. Man is the highest. Israel, as the confessor of the one God, outranks the polytheistic heathen. E. Man is free to choose between good and evil and is responsible for his choice. God is absolute unity. Form and matter are ideas in him. In strict construction, attributes may not be predicated of him. Will and wisdom are identical with his being. Only through the things which have emanated from God may man learn and comprehend aught of God. Between God and the world is a chasm bridged only by mediatorial beings, at least two. God is neither hidden nor beyond comprehension. The external cosmos unveils him. It implies the presence of an original source superior to it. And, furthermore, through insight and the Spirit sent from on high, God is discovered by those who remain faithful to him. Thus God's Spirit is universally present. This Spirit is, in a sense, separate from God, an extension of the divine essence, relating God to the tangible world. However, this Spirit is not a distinct or lesser being. Wisdom and this Spirit are used interchangeably. Wisdom is a spirit that is devoted to humanity. Wisdom is a mist of the power of God, a reflection of eternal light. This wisdom has 21 attributes. It is a discerning spirit, sacred, unique, varied, subtle, freely moving, clear in speech, pure, 
distinct, untouched, benevolent, loving what is good, perceptive, unobstructed, generous, loving toward humanity, steadfast, reliable, unconcerned, omnipotent, all-seeing, and penetrating through all spirits that are perceptive, pure, and most subtle. Wisdom is a person, the counselor at God's throne, the chooser of God's works. She was present with God when he created the universe. She is the architect of all things. Since these attributes are also applied to God, it is clear that this wisdom is viewed merely as a tool, not as a representative of the divine. The wisdom of Solomon also discusses the Logos, and this, in conjunction with its unique perspective on wisdom, makes the text an essential link in the transition from the absolute God concept of Palestinian Judaism to the theory of the mediating agency of the Word in Philo. But wisdom existed prior to the heavens and the earth. God is the molder of the cosmos, statements which, though not entirely clear enough to form a definite conclusion, also suggest in Aristobulus's theology a departure from the idea of God's transcendence and his immediate control of all as the creator ex nihilo. Philo presents the Logos as the intermediary between the transcendent God and the empirical world. Philo is also the pioneering Jewish writer to attempt to establish the existence of God. His reasoning falls into two categories, those derived from the natural world and those derived from the inner perceptions of the soul. The human mind, though intangible, occupies a similar role to that of God in the cosmos. From this, one can attain knowledge of God. The mind rules over the body. The universe must similarly have a ruler who maintains its coherence and governs it with justice, and who is the supreme. Philo attributes personality to God. It was especially Israel's responsibility to declare God's unity. In historical occurrences, although God's revelations vary and change according to the context, the same singular God is evident. Efforts are made to counter the arguments based on the use of plural forms in biblical references to God, nor according to R. Gamaliel is the use of both bara and yazar to signify God's creative acts, indicative of the presence of two distinct divine entities. Genesis. The reason one man alone was created at the beginning was to counter the belief in multiple personalities within God, man's rationale, not God's. Human experience and the history of Israel testify to God's existence, who is perceived as the living, personal, eternal, all sustaining, the origin of all life the creator and ruler of the universe, the father of all, the just judge, extending mercy by forgiving sins and embracing all in his love. He is both transcendent and immanent. Every human soul partakes to some extent in the divine essence. The text reflects on God's nature as surpassing simple human classifications emphasizing the divine unity and the roles of different aspects of the divine presence, spirit, wisdom. It integrates traditional Jewish and Christian perspectives on the nature of God and the interplay between the divine and human spheres. Divine Names of God The name YHWH is regarded as the primary name. It was known in the earliest rabbinical texts simply as the name. 
the Tetragrammaton, or the four-lettered name. Biblical historiography proposes that God disclosed himself progressively to Adam, Noah, Abraham, and his progeny, and ultimately to Moses. Thus, monotheism was introduced to humanity in general, and to Israel in particular from the very outset. In contrast, the modern critical approach views monotheism as the eventual result of a lengthy process of religious development, supporting its theory with certain evidence found in the biblical texts, as well as the parallels observed between Israel's historical trajectory and that of other Semitic cultures. Yet human beings possess the gift of immortal thoughts. These thoughts culminate in the perception of God. They transcend the boundaries of the entire material world to reach the uncreated. This divine intuition was especially reserved for the prophets, Abraham and Jacob. The early religion of Israel and its conception of God reflected the shared primitive Semitic religious beliefs, which, although modified in biblical times and largely eradicated, have left their mark on the theological doctrines of later Israel. Renan's hypothesis, presented in his Précis et Système Comparé des Langues Sémitiques, 1859, attributing to the Semites a monotheistic inclination, has been rejected as it clashed with the evidence. According to available epigraphic evidence, traditions, and folklore, the Semites are shown to have had polytheistic, dualistic tendencies. The meaning of El, the common Semitic term, remains uncertain. It has also been linked to Ella, the sacred tree. The use of the plural Elohim in Hebrew is equally enigmatic. Traces of an original polytheism might be reflected in it. The Jewish Encyclopedia the ineffable name was pronounced Adonai, and where Adonai and Elohim appear together, the latter was articulated as Elohim. Eloha, Elohim, the term Eloha, meaning God, in its plural form, Elohim, seems to be an extended variant of El, Aramaic Ela, Arabic Ela. The singular Eloha is relatively infrequent in the Bible outside of Job, where it appears approximately 40 times. The plural form is used, including in reference to a goddess as Solomon pursued Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Zidonians, and Milcom, the detestable deity of the Ammonites, 1 Kings 11.5. When referring to Israel's God, it is used extensively, more than 2,000 times, and often with the article Ha, Elohim, the true God. Occasionally, the plural form Elohim, even when referring to the God of Israel, is construed with a plural verb or adjective, particularly in the phrase Elohim Hayim, meaning the living God. In most cases, however, the plural form is treated as if it were a singular noun. The unusual use of a plural noun to designate the sole God of Israel has been interpreted in various ways, none of which fully elucidate the divine significance. H.W. The personal name of the God of Israel is written in the Hebrew Bible with four consonants Y-W-H and is known as the Tetragrammaton. Up until the destruction of the first temple in 586 BCE, 
This name was commonly pronounced with its proper vowels, as indicated by the Lachish letters, written shortly before this period. However, by the 3rd century BCE, the pronunciation of the name Yahweh was avoided, and Adonai, meaning the Lord, was used instead, as demonstrated by the Greek term Kyrios, Lord, employed for Yahweh in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Hebrew scriptures, initiated by Greek-speaking Jews in that century. The true pronunciation of the name Yahweh was never completely lost. Several early Greek authors of the Christian church affirmed that the name was pronounced Yahweh. Many scholars believe that Yahweh derives from a verbal form of the root HWH, which is an older variant of the root HYH, meaning to be. Encyclopedia Judaica. Yahweh, pronounced Yah V, represents the eternal, ever living, self subsisting being. He is the supreme creator from whom all things, both visible and invisible, material and spiritual, originate. He conceived the complete plan and design for all creation. In the original Hebrew scriptures, which constitute the 39 books of our Bible, from Genesis to Malachi, the Hebrew Tetragrammaton Yahweh, appears 6,123 times. When the vowels are included, the name becomes pronounceable as Yahweh. When the Hebrew scriptures were translated into English, the true name of the supreme being, Yahweh, was replaced with the title Lord. Similarly, the Jews replaced the true name with Adonai. Yahweh embodies spirit, life, and love. The name resonates with the act of breathing inspiration and expiration. Inhaling and exhaling, spirit signifies wind or air in motion. In the act of breathing, one is subtly pronouncing the name Yahweh. Naturally, there is much more to the name than merely the act of breathing. Zebaot. This compound divine name is primarily found in the prophetic writings. The original meaning of Zebaot is likely reflected in 1 Samuel 17.45, where Yahweh Zebaot is interpreted as the God of the armies of Israel. It is also significant that the name Yahweh Zebaot is repeatedly associated with the Ark, a feminine noun, which symbolized God's presence among his people's hosts. Later, and particularly in prophetic contexts, the term was extended to the celestial hosts, or rather the heavenly hosts, were incorporated alongside the earthly ones. Who is God? A.H. represents the positive absolute masculine spirit, akin to the positive absolute masculine current in electricity. B.E.H. signifies the negative absolute feminine spirit, comparable to the negative absolute feminine current in electricity. The positive alone generates nothing. The negative alone generates nothing. However, when you press a button or flip a switch, you combine the positive and negative, resulting in light, heat, and power. These phenomena are the products of the union between the masculine positive current and the feminine negative current. When Yah, representing positive masculine spirit, joins with VEH, representing negative feminine spirit, the outcome is Yah-Veh, the union of father-mother spirit creates a being known as the only begotten son. I don't find the concept of the Trinity Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as difficult to grasp.
It is actually quite straightforward because every individual is a trinity, or three in one. If you are male, you are predominantly masculine from your father, secondarily feminine from your mother, and you are your own self, or person, a man. As a combination of father and mother, you are a person. If you are female, you are predominantly feminine from your mother, secondarily masculine from your father, and you are a woman, your own person. Every living being is a trinity. In spiritual terms, the father is Yah. The mother or Holy Spirit is VH. United, they form a person in the Son. In the extended form of the names, the father is Yahweh, the mother or Holy Spirit is Kaveh, and the son is Yahshua. The name Yahweh encompasses the Supreme Being entirely. To me, accepting Yahweh as light, love, and power, and as the very essence of life within me, poses no difficulty. Three are one father, mother, and son, or father, mother, and daughter, and everyone is three. This is true for you, me, and every person on earth. You are the result of a father and a mother. This is a scientific fact and is perfectly logical. Consider it from another perspective. You are a person. You received your body from your father and mother and your spirit, representing your life and breath, from Yahweh. Therefore, you are the product of father, mother, and Yahweh, embodying both human and divine, material and spiritual aspects. In the original Hebrew scriptures, the name Elohim appears 5,000 times. It is a plural term and denotes the heavenly family. It includes all the sons and daughters of Yahweh. His family is referred to as the Elohim. For this plural term, English Bible translators use the singular title, God. God is not a name, but a pagan title substituted for Elohim. If a substitute was necessary, it should have been plural, gods. This is clearly evident in your English Bible. For example, consider this scripture in English. And God said, Let us make man in our image. Genesis 1.26 It is well known that us and our are plural. Remember, whenever you encounter Lord in the English translations of the Hebrew scriptures, it substitutes for Yahweh, and wherever you find God, it substitutes for Elohim. When you say Lord God, the true Hebrew would be Yahweh Elohim, meaning the Supreme Being and His family. The first verse of the Bible is crucial to understanding all that follows. In the English Bible it reads, In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Genesis 1.1 The accurate rendering of the Hebrew scriptures is, By headships and periods, the Elohim created the heavens and the earth. 